Shalom, shalom. Great to see you all. Thank you so much for being here. We are going to start with a little poll. We have a great debate today. The Gra versus the Besht, the Vilna Goen versus the Baal Shem Tov, mysticism of the mind versus mysticism of the heart. So let's start with a little poll. How do you know what you know? How do you know what you know? I know most deeply through the mind, through reason. I know most deeply through the heart, through emotion. I know most deeply from ancient texts and traditional wisdom. I know most deeply through the soul. Wow. Wow. Okay, take a moment to cast your vote. Cast very carefully because, you know, every vote counts. Every vote counts in democracy. You can't uh, throw away any vote. So uh, let's give you a few more seconds here. Vote for your freedom. Okay, let's see the results we have here. Wow, wow, a big diversity. Whoa, 50% know through the mind, know through the realm of reason. 10% through the heart, through emotion. 10% from text and wisdom, traditional wisdom. And 30% through the soul. Wow, okay. So today's debate um, is gonna touch on how do we know what we know? How do we know what we know? Okay, friends, one of the greatest debates in Jewish history is about the nature of Jewish theology. Is the belief system of Judaism fundamentally rationalism-based, thereby lining up with human reason, or is it fundamentally a mysticism-based, thereby transcending human reason? Is the Jews' relationship to the concept of divinity to be lived in the study house or in the field? Is Judaism a set of ideas to be understood exclusively by the elite or is it a religion for the masses? This debate can be observed most poignantly in the clash between the Baal Shem Tov, the Besht, and the Vilna Goen, the Gra. Rabbi Israel ben Eliezer, known as the Baal Shem Tov or the Besht, lived in 18th century Poland. This is not actually a picture of him. We don't have any pictures of him, but you can imagine he looks something like this. <laughs> and was a highly regarded and beloved teacher and healer. He didn't write his teachings. Some people says, claim he was illiterate. Probably not, but some people claim that. He didn't write any of his teachings, probably out of humility, but rather had students such as Rabbi Yaakov Yosef of Polnoy and Dovber, known as the Magid of Mezrich, who expressed his ideas as they understood them, both orally and in various writings. The Shivchei HaBesht and the Toldot Yaakov Yosef. What mattered most to the Besht was not studying Talmud, 
or intellectual debate, but devekut, clinging to the divine. He prioritized playing, praying in the field. Maybe he played in the field also, but praying in the field and meditating over studying in the Beit Midrash. Rather than celebrating the elite and intellectual sage, the best thinking and approach gave power to the humble worker who was seeking God and the just life. This radical innovation served as the catalyst for and germination of Hasidut or Hasidus. Indeed, he is kin considered the founder of Hasidut by all Hasidic sects. The Hasidic sects don't like each other. They don't want to marry each other. They don't want to have children together. They don't want to dance together, especially Satmar and Chabad. But they all agreed that Baal Shem Tov is the founder of all the Hasidic groups. Now, when we talk about Hasidic Jews today in the 21st century, we are, of course, talking about something very, very different than the Baal Shem Tov. Today, we think of legal stringencies, we think of exclusivity, we think about separation and isolation. The Baal Shem Tov was, we think about conformity. The Baal Shem Tov was radical. This was one of the most radical innovations in Jewish history. Now, let's, let's, let's know a little bit about his context. As a young boy, Israel was orphaned and adopted by the Jewish community of Toulouse. Even as a child, after his formal studies, he would wander into the fields alone. As he grew, he developed a deep soul and became attracted to prayer, to healing, and to storytelling. He wrote amulets and offered spiritual cures. He spoke about visions he had and Kabbalah he learned. He cared for the poor and he tended to his students. He worked for a short time as a shochet, as a butcher, kosher butcher. But ultimately, the allure of ideas and concepts attributed to him that were lofty and deep, spiritual and accessible, led to the image of the best as a charismatic leader. As the movement of Hasidut developed, the best spiritual and intellectual descendants be became regarded as Sadiqim, righteous seekers of God, whose role in Hasidic communities placed that of the sage to a, sick, to a significant degree, displaced the sage to a, a significant degree. God, for so many of the followers of the Besht, was not merely some abstraction beyond the universe, but was also a personal deity who was loving, close, and present in all that we do. In this panentheistic approach, the quintessential humble shoemaker and peddler can be the closest one to God if they direct their kavanah, their spiritual intentionality, appropriately. As a generalized matter, then the thinking of Hasidut places much emphasis on the spirit of the law and relative, relatively less on the letter of the law. This novel approach to the Jewish observance and devotion was controversial, and as expected, there was fierce opposition. One might even say death threats. Okay, that's the Baal Shem Tov. Now we're going to go to his Bar Plugta, to his, uh, his opponent. Rabbi Eliyahu ben Shlomo Zalman, Rabbi Elijah ben Solomon Zalman, ben Solomon Zalman which is interesting because Solomon and Zalman are, are, um, are, are, are basically the same, known as the Vilma Goen or the Gra, was born in what is today Belarus, lived during the 18th century, and was a renowned Talmudist, Halachist, and Kabbalist. Himself, again, a Kabbalist, he shared with the followers of, Hasid, of, Hasidim, of Hasidism a desire to understand the mysteries of divine reality. Yet at the same time, he opposed so much of early Hasidut and is therefore considered to have been the, or at least a significant leader of the Misnagdim, the, the Mitznagdim, which means the opponents. They are the opponents to the Hasidim. They're called Misnagdim. Uh, some people call them Litvaks. The Gra believed in mysticism in his own way, but rejected emerging Hasidic Judaism that took applied mysticism in new directions. He was deeply engaged in the study of math and science in addition to pure Torah texts. He offered new critical methods to Talmudic learning and studied Hebrew grammar closely. He was known to be extremely modest in his lifestyle, and had many ascetic practices, like having his feet in ice when he studied Talmud all day and night, things like this. 
starving himself, but the Gra took active steps to curb the influence of Hasidic Judaism, even supporting the idea of excommunicating Hasidic Jew leaders. Some even say he was guilty of Masira, of turning in Hasidic Jews to the anti-Semitic authorities. So if the Gra believed in mysticism, why was he so firm and vehemently opposed to Hasidic Judaism? Given the Gra's deep humility and rejection of power status, this seems to not have not been about power and ego, as one might suspect, but rather about a belief in the centrality of the mind and the centrality of study over the realm of emotion and, and of soul, of devotion over the intellect. Part of his intensity likely emerged from a fear of the return of the failed messianic movements that followed Shabbatai Svi and Jacob Frank during the 17th and 18th, early 18th century centuries respectively. It's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to overemphasize the importance of that, friends. These, these messianic movements were devastating to the traditional Jewish world, that these people emerged, people really thought they were Mashiach, they followed these people, and were massive disappointments. And so a, a huge amount of skepticism emerged around charismatic leaders, particularly those who had any approach to innovation. Along with concern with the return of the Sabatian and the Frankist movements came unease about what would happen if other charismatic messianic style healers exercised power over the Jewish masses. So the Gras said, forget charismatic leaders, study the text, learn, trust your mind, don't trust, don't trust charismatic authorities. Some wondered if the new Hasidim would actually be Sabatians or Frankists themselves even when those Hasidic leaders spoke out against the, the, about the, the performance of miracles and experience of visions that were dangerous lies and anathema to Judaism. Perhaps though, much of the opposition to Hasidut on the part of the Gra and his followers had to do with social antipathy and political opposition. The Mitznagdim, the opponents, were mostly based in Lithuania in relatively close proximity to the Hasidim and the most intense clashes between the two groups occurred in the late 18th century after the Baal Shem Tov had already passed. But contemporaneous with the rapid spread of Hasidism, which the Mitzanagdim were unsuccessful in stopping, they couldn't stop it, it spread like wildfire. They started to innovate in their own ways, such as with Rabbi Chaim of Elijah's novel analytic approach to Talmud study and Rabbi Yisrael Salanter's new Musar movement. That's why today we think of, we don't think of Musar and Hasidut as being at odds, but in the early days they were at odds. And part of that is that the Musar movement places the self at the center. It is about the character development of the individual. And Hasidut places God at the center. It is about the humility of the self to submit and cling to divinity. These in a, and for the Gra, it's about the text. You make the text the center. These innovations were somewhat subtle relative to the practical and external Hasidic practices and the popularization of the Lurianic Kabbalistic approach developed in the 16th century by Rabbi Isaac Luria and his student Rabbi Chaim Vital, which were large and sweeping. And with the growth of both Hasidism and its misnagdic opposition came a further articulation of the differences between the two approaches. Many misnagdim felt that Hasidus' panentheism, God is in everything in this world, but also beyond, and the utter reverence given to many of its leaders by their followers could lose, that panentheism could lead to pantheism, i.e. God is in this world, but nothing beyond, like Spinoza argues, and radical messianism. Further, they had a deep distrust for the considerable emphasis within Hasidut on erotic imagery as applied to the relationship between humans and God, as well as a disdain for the Hasidic tendency to overtly demonstrate piety during prayer. If you've ever been to a, a, a Hasidic shul, especially like Breslov, people are jumping around, they're dancing, they're clapping, they're really, they're very ecstatic. If you go to a misnagdic place, people are silent, in fact, my friend on this call, Isaac and I were in a shul a week ago, and uh, we, we literally whispered to each other, and somebody shushed us like we were in a 1980s library. 
I only say 1980s because I haven't been in a library since the 1980s. <laughs> so maybe they still shush you in a library. But, but, um, uh, but literally, in a Masnav de Shul, that you're going to see that Christian influence, right? That a house of worship is to be a place that's quiet, right? Um, in, in the Hasidic world, it's the opposite. It is, it, it's ecstatic, it's noisy, it's loud, there's jumping and dancing. It's a whole different, it's a whole different uh, culture. From the perspective of non-Hasidim, it was a subversive re reordering that the Hasidim proposed. What Has Hasidism did was reorder and reprioritize Jewish values. The tzaddik over the scholar, right? The righteous one over, over the intellectual. Prayer over Torah study, the heart over the mind. Eminence over transcendence. God is close. We don't leave this world to find God. We go deeper within the soul and God is right here. Another major departure has to do with how one relates to the past. From a misnantic perspective, people of the past were essentially holier, wiser, and closer to God and truth than even contemporary pietists could be. For the chassid, by contrast, each person could reach the level of an earlier sage. Rav Kalonimus Kalman Epstein, an 18th century Hasidic thinker, even wrote that with spiritual work, anyone can reach the, the understanding of Moshe Rabbeinu, the, the level of Moses. This new movement was about radical reflection. Rabbi Adin Steinzoltz writes, one of the great Hasidic rabbis, who was the rabbi of a small town in his youth and would often volunteer to serve as a merrymaker at weddings, would say that the essence of Hasidism is that one must constantly be asking why about everything that one encounters in life. Everything returns to why, which is what my two-year-old loves to say. No matter what I say, it's why. <laughs> that is the way his life went, he said. One day when he went to perform the ritual washing of the hands, this question of why occurred to him. He began to reflect on the ritual and he stood there, towel on his shoulder for two hours. He said that afterward, whenever he recited the blessing on the ritual, his level of devotion was higher than ever. So friends, this question of why is not, oh, why do we technically do it? Of course, these scholars knew the answer of where in the text guides us, where in the tradition the custom emerged from. The question of why is how is this ritual a transformative vehicle in my life, right? It's not, oh, what source, right? Why do Jews do this? Okay, if you, we could Google that. You want the answer to basic questions, you can Google anything. You want the answer to a deep question, you can't find it on Google. You got to stand there with a towel on your shoulder for two hours and say, why in this moment does God want me to wash my hands? Why on this Friday night am I saying Kiddush? And the answer is not, oh, because Jews said Kiddush for thousands of years. The answer is not because that's how we sanctify Shabbos. The answer is not because grape juice had an important role in Jewish culture in this time period and that. The question is, why in this moment existentially is this a transformative practice for me? Imagine if we live like that. Imagine if every time we engaged in a spiritual practice, it wasn't just about relying on the past, but was a radical awakening to the moment. The question of why, as to why me, why now do I engage in this? Friends, another fascinating difference can be found in how we relate to one who errs, one who mistakes. However much early Miss Nagbi might have had some tolerance and pluralistic inclinations, they did judge their Hasidic co-religionists very harshly to the point where they even viewed them as deserving of excommunication, excommunication. Many early Hasidim, on the other hand, professed a new sense of tolerance based on love. Consider this teaching from the 18th century Hasidic Rebbe, uh, Shneer Zalman of Liabi, known as the Alta Rebbe. Even those to whom one is close and whom one's reprimands fail to sway from their wrongs, one must love them despite the commandment to hate them. For both are true. One must hate the evil in them and love the good buried in them, the divine spark they carry. This might feel obvious to us today. We say that today, hate the sinner, excuse me, hate the sin, not the sinner. This might feel obvious to us today, but this was a big deal. This was a big deal in an era where people were excommunicated for having doubts in their faith 
if you left traditional observance, you were out of the community, you couldn't marry, you couldn't do business. This is a big deal. And consider how, how this idea that love is to be extended to all of creation is beautifully expressed in one Hasidic tale as recording, recorded by Rabbi Talushkin. One Hasidic master, Rav Zushya of, Han, of Hanipol, was so pained by the sight of caged birds that he would purchase them from their owners and set them free. He regarded this as a form of pidyon shvuyim, ransoming of captives, which is the highest form of charity when performed on behalf of human beings. Rav Zushya apparently felt that it was a moral imperative to spare animals, particularly birds, whose very nature demands freedom, the suffering of captivity. Now friends, if you saw in the Arizona Republic tomorrow, Shmuley Yanklowitz goes to the zoo and frees the elephants and the tigers. You say, oh my goodness, what a radical. I'm not showing up at this Beit Midrash anymore. This guy broke into the zoo and freed the elephants. Like, a zoo is a, is, a, is a hallmark of our city. Like what kind, what kind of vandal is this? You know, some kind of animal rights extremist, right? But this Rav Zushi of Hanipol would, okay, so he didn't break the law, but he, he would buy the birds in order to free them, right? He wanted to free every, every caged bird every caged bird. Um, and, and he saw this, um, he saw this as an expression of love, an expression of freedom, which the divine wants, that every being be free. Okay, just to wrap up here, because we have a lot to talk about, what's remarkable about the grand debate between the proponents and the opponents of early Hasidism is that in the end, neither side won. Or perhaps better, better stated, both sides won. Hasidim came to study Talmud, and elements of Hasidic thought evolved into the neo-Hasidism of Martin Buber in the early 20th century and of, of Art Green more recently. The yeshivish world is frequently allied with the Hasidic, and despite itself, Litvish yeshivot can be seen as having left an intellectual inheritance for what became modern orthodoxy. We can talk about other movements as well. Both Hasidism and Misnagdim in many ways came to learn from and be influenced by one another. Neither group fully resembles the movement as it existed in its earlier state. So where does that leave us today? Will we give power to the unknowable or only to that which we know? Will we cling to the most wise and complex thinkers or to the most pure, innocent, and, and simple of people? Will we find our truth in the text or in the heart? Each of us will need to find our own path in this regard. And maybe for some of us, the best path will be a synthesis of these various approaches. We can be grateful for the intellectual and emotional chasm between Hasidim, Hasidim and Misnagdim because their streams of thought, both independently and by virtue of their interaction, have given us different models to explore and to cherish. Okay, friends, that is the, that is the Baal Shem Tov versus the Gra, the mysticism of the heart versus mysticism of the mind. I would love to hear from you. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Uh, I, I take the question maybe a step further right. because of uh, two aspects of, to it. One is how we think about this will have influence on who, what groups uh, for Jewish observance, but both at the synagogue level, do we participate in and, and fill meeting our needs? And secondly, how can we make, how our group interact with others? Goes earlier when you talked about orthodox versus reform, one of the criticisms I feel for the Orthodox is, is the rejection of, of, of it. So I think, the, I think the debate today has ramifications on a higher level uh, of our Judaism personally and how we interact in, in the wider Jewish world. Great, great, Michael. Thank you so much. There, there's a lot to unpack there. The kind of questions we can leave with from here are not only historical, um, they're deeply personal, 
around the, the way we know, the type of Judaism we want to participate in. And as Michael said, it's also about how we view the other. How do we view other Jews? How do we view other Gentiles? Our sense of tolerance, our sense of other people's role. And that was perhaps the most subversive dimension of the Baal Shem Tov. The most subversive dimension in that the Baal Shem Tov uh, empowered the simpleton um, and respected the simpleton, right? Um, whereas the elitist did not. The simpleton now um, is can reach the heights of the heavens, just like the complex thinker. So thank you for that, Michael. Very, very nice. There was a um, there was a reference earlier to uh, prayer. Someone quoted and said prayer over Torah. Um, is is the right way to think about this that whichever camp you belong in, you still would uh, consistently and aggressively study quote unquote the Torah, read the Torah. Or, or is a better way to think about it, there's a mystical approach to studying the Torah and a non-mystical, or like, how does the Torah fit into these oh, two Oh, that's things? great, that's great. Okay, so first to distinguish between the, the prayer approach versus the Torah approach, Torah learning approach, and then to, uh, to say, how does both sides learn the Torah differently? Great, great, thank you, Scott. So yes, so the other big subversive approach here is that the, the chassid, the tzaddik, is not going to sit in the Beit Midrash studying Talmud all day and all night. That's not what you do as a religious Jew. You go to the field. You talk to God. You go raise money and charity for the poor. You go and you engage in radical spiritual practices. You go to the mikvah and you immerse in the spiritual waters for an hour every day, right? You are going to engage in radical spiritual practices rather than sit and study. Okay. Yeah. However, Scott is exactly right that Hasidic thinkers the Baal Shem Tov and the like, are still very much engaged in Torah learning, but in a very different way. So I'm going to write here on the side a reminder of Pardes. Pardes means Pshat, Remez, Drush, and Sod. Those are four different ways to study the Torah. The Pshat is the simple interpretation, the literal reading. The Remez, better, it's really without the E on the end. Um, the Remez is the, the, the hint the hint there. The drush is kind of a new interpretation, and the sod is the hidden meaning in the text. The Hasidic thinkers are all about studying the Torah for the sod. They want the hidden meaning that is a that according to like the gra is a total distortion of the Torah. Where did you get that from? It doesn't say that in the text, right? Yeah. But they want they want a much deeper, soulful meaning from the text that is clearly not the literal interpretation. They're going to use gematria, numerology. They're going to use other mystical approaches to finding the name of God in the text. They're going to look for the, the soulful interpretation of a text rather than uh, just the, the legal interpretation. And, and, and one other thing to say about that, in addition to how they interpret it, for the gra, you are doing an intellectual activity when you're learning, mostly. For the Hasidic thinkers, this is another way that you are clinging to God while you are studying. And so the Grah is going to debate, he's going to fight, he's going to think, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna tear, tear his mind back and forth. The Hasidic thinkers, they're going to be singing the text. They're going to be singing the verses. They're going to they're gonna be almost praying the verses while they're studying them. Right, mm. the, the way they're engaging, they're, uh, it's 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 a prayerful activity to study. It's not a debate. Okay, Scott, does that does that answer Perfect. a little bit? Perfect, really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, who else has has some thoughts or questions? Uh, I've got a quick question. I think you've done a great job explaining both. I. I... Reminds me, I need to actually get more familiar with with the Gra. But um, what I, I'm kind of curious is, you gave an example where Baal Shem, you know, where the Shem Tovs of now the Chabad and and uh, some uh, some But um, I'm, I'm guess what I'm kind of curious is to an extension of the two. Has there been new efforts, a new movement, or sects that have tried to take on where uh, kind of a blend of the two? 
uh, where it's not an acceptance of one over the other or yeah. one or the other, but more of yeah. it's somewhere in the middle. They miss both, but here's a, like a third way to look at it. Okay. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Very good. So this will sound, um, this will sound uh, strange to some, but they do talk about pluralism and tolerance and unity in the ultra Orthodox world. And what they mean is not you and me, right? What they mean by, by that is, oh, Hasidic and Misnagdim, right? We are pluralistic. We are about the unity of the Jewish people. We accept Satmar. We accept Lubavitch. We accept the Belzer Hasidim. We accept the Misnagdim. We are like all about love of the Jewish people. Oh, oh those reform the Kim, the conservatives, the liberal Orthodox, like the secular, the secular Israelis. Oh, well, obviously not them. Like they're not a part of, 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 the, of the Torah true Judaism, right? But for them, like they do actually have a framework of unity. They call, it's, it's actually, it's interesting. They call these unity events in the interfaith world. When we talk about unity events, we're like, there's a Muslim guy, there's a Christian woman, there's, a, there's someone Sikh, right? There's, there's a Native American, right? There's, there's gender diversity and racial diversity and, um, and ideological diversity. And it's a unity event because it represents humanity. When they talk about unity events, they mean different types of ultra-Orthodox Jews. And so, um, and, and they really think about that as expansive. Like, that's a challenge for them. They're like, wait a minute. Like, I, they really, really disagree with Hasidic Judaism. They're like, oh, I'll give one example. Zmanim, how you calculate the times. The Misnagdim, the, the, um, the Haredim, the, the, um, the, the, um, the non-Hasidic ultra-Orthodox, they are very strict on times. You have to say Shema by this time. You have to say the Amidah by this time. This is exactly when Shabbos starts. The Hasidic world, the relationship to Zmanim is very different. The Baal Shem Tov, this is one of the critiques. They find him in the field, davening Shachri in the afternoon. So at Shachri afternoon, you had to stop by 10 o'clock. How could you be at 1 o'clock? No, very different relationship to time. So this is a big stretch for them. So when they have this unity, in the, they, in, in the, in the non-Hasidic yeshiva, they will have a Hasidic class sometimes. And they'll think about that as an integration. And in the Hasidic world, they pre pre predominantly study Talmud. And so they view that as an integration. So they view it as they both won, they both partnered. Now, leaving the ultra-Orthodox world, looking at the, the broader Jewish world, I think what we see here is in twofold. One is neo-Hasidut. In neo-Hasidut, um, outside of orthodoxy, you see a blend. You see a blend. You know, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, here we're talking about Shlomo Karlbach. We're talking about Zalman Shachter Shalomi. We're talking about Art Green. Um, today, there's a whole, a whole bunch of other players as well. Um, Neil, Neil Hasidut, which seeks to be plural, pluralistic and tolerant and liberal, um, and yet engage in the more ecstatic experiential dimension that you will find um, in, the renewal, in the renewal world. The other way you can see it is in the influence it has, not only in the renewal world, but how it, the influence it's had in the reform conservative reconstructionist modern Orthodox world, um, where you do see some of this energy is emphasized um, and some of these teachings are emphasized. And to give one example, if you listen to a high holiday reform a reform or conservative or modern orthodox sermon, you'll, you're likely, or, or uh, if not likely, it is highly possible you'll hear a Hasidic story, right? I think that's the biggest carryover. Even I, a very cold reform temple, by cold, I don't mean to judge it. I sort of mean one that's kind of high church. It's like organs and a choir and people aren't participating. They're just sitting in their chairs quietly while they attend a performance. Um, the opposite of a, a neo-Hasidic experience where everyone's kind of dancing and singing and it's not frontal, but it's participatory. Um, in that type of place you, where the influence is the Hasidic story, not the Hasidic energy. And so the Hasidic story is everywhere. The Kutzke Rebbe, um, the, the stories about the Baal Shem Tov, stories about the little child who comes and says the Aleph Bet in Shur plays his flute. And the rabbi says, oh, he's closer to God than all of you because he played with all of his heart right so there we see that influence so yeah thanks eric thanks for that
Okay, Yehuda, where are we at here, Yehuda? So first of all, I have to ask you what you're saying, Miss Nadik, Miss Nadim. I don't know that word. Great, I'm gonna put it in the side. Miss, Miss Nadim, or pro also pronounced Neet Nagdim. Oh, Neet okay. Nagdim. That means um, the uh, the opposition, the opponents. They the, the, they were called Miss Nagdim because they were the early and adamant rejection. Um, uh, 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 ones who rejected Hasidut, the Hasidic thinkers. And so some people, again, called them Litvaks because they were from Lithuania. Litvak is Lithuanian. It was kind of synonymous in some sense. But Misnagi means they are, the, they are the opponents and they were grouped together as the opposing force. I don't know about you, but I don't want an identity as, 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 uh, that's primarily about opposing another group. <laughs> yeah, that seems to be bringing up a lot of problems these days, I think. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, you know, um, to give an example from, you know, a famous quote from Barack Obama, where he said, uh, he was being critical of progressive activists. And he said, if, if all you do is cast stones on people, all you do is cast aspersions on people, you're not going to get very far. There are people who they love that all they are is agitators. All they are is opponents. All they are is protesters. They have nothing generative to say, nothing generative to do. They just want to rage on Twitter, rage at a protest. Um, and Barack Obama was very critical of that. And he lost a part of the far left through that. Um, but he said, look, if you want to get somewhere, yes, of course you have to be an agitator. Of course you have to be a resistor. Of course you have to oppose. But you have to be generative and constructive also. You can't just break down. And so to have an identity is just being in opposition. I, you know, Ben Shapiro's whole identity is I'm an opposition to the liberals. Like that is identity. Like I'm a liberal fighter or far left who's like, I'm a resistor of fascism. Right? Okay, so good job. It's great to be a resistor. But if that's, if that's all you are, right, then what is that identity? Just, just be a misnagit, to just be an opponent. So, so again, I think with the binary thinking, it's like, how do we pull these two points of view together and take the best of both of them and synthesize great, it? Great, great, great. So, okay, great. Because, yeah, yeah Gihuta, keep going, keep going, yeah. Well, that's, that's my main question. Yeah. It's like, you know, I, I, I think that, yeah, we need to look for a way because there's good parts to both, you know? Great. great. <laughs> Okay, great. So here, there is an empirical question, and there is a, uh, a personal que uh, question. The empirical question, Kant and Hume had a famous debate. How do humans make moral decisions? Um, and according to Kant, um, we should, and to some degree do, um, make decisions through the realm of reason. Human beings are rational creatures. We think and based on our ideas, make decisions. Hume strongly disagreed and believed that all reason is merely a justification of the realm of emotion. We want something, we desire something. We have an inclination from something subconsciously, and then we attach a reason to it, right? Either I emotionally feel there's an a God or not, and then I give some reason for it. Either I love you or I don't, and then I give a reason why I love you or I don't, right? I justify my life, but really my life is something that is, is you know, in a Freudian sense, it really is unconscious or subconscious. It is in the realm of feeling uh, that we don't even understand. And we just use reason to justify. So part of the question here as to how should we be in the world has to grapple with the question is how, actually, how are we actually? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, and maybe you have a hunch for yourself as to whether you're always just using reason to justify your emotion or your disposition, if you will, or whether you really have made choices in your life that are in the realm of reason that really overcome your disposition. Yes, I really want this. I really am inclined to that. But I really think this is true. And so even though I feel so attached to this religion, right, emotionally, I'm going to leave this religion because I really intellectually think it's false. Or um, emotionally, right, I feel like um, 
I um, should be with this person or not be with this person. But in the realm of reason, I'm going to come to a different conclusion, right? So this is very complicated. Now, going aside from the empirical question to our personal Judaism today, I think um, that this is an exciting opportunity that Yehuda is raising of how do we build a movement, a 21st century Judaism, which is not just simple. Oh, I slap reform on it. I slap orthodox on it. Now it's good, right? As long as it's my denomination, I'm fine. No, 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 no. How do we create a 21st century Judaism which is smart, it is thoughtful, it is kind, it is compassionate, but it is also deep, it is wise, it's emotional, it's prayerful, it's soulful. And for some, they have to choose one between the other. Oh, I'm not, a, I, I, I'm not gonna show up at a Beit Midrash, I don't wanna study, I wanna just be in the soulful world. Or the opposite, oh, I'm not a hippie dippy Jew, I don't wanna dance around or sing or pray, I, I just wanna study. Right? No, no, we gotta challenge ourselves, we gotta challenge ourselves out of our comfort zone. These two go hand in hand. They go hand in hand, right? That the way that we participate spiritually is not a whole different way of being of how we participate in the world intellectually. Those two can intersect. They can and should intersect. And in fact, in Kabbalah, in the spherot, the 10 layers in the spherot, you see that the spherot line up with the human body. Chachma, Bina, and Dat. The, the three highest realms of the spherot are about the intellectual realm, how the intellectual realm interacts with the emotional realm, how the intellectual realm interacts with the, with the soulful realm. It's a false dichotomy, the realm of soul and the realm of mind. For Plato and the Greeks, when they talked about um, the soul, they were talking about the mind, right? So there's, there's a big overlap here. Let's see if Della or Matt or Matthew Newman or Michael Kasoy, any, if anyone else wants to jump in before we circle back to others. Uh, I have a question on the local yes. level. I don't know if you're comfortable right. answering this or not. Right. Uh, what we've observed is you're trying to bring together and people who, and, and, and not much involvement from the orthodox parts of our community. Is this a fact a micronism, a micro? Awesome. Of, of the challenges of trying to accomplish the vision that you were just sharing with us? Great, great. I'm making a note of that, Michael. I'm going to come back to that one. Thank you for that. It's a great question. Okay, Della, I see your hands up. Della, you want to, you want to go? Um, sure. It's not really a question, but more of a comment regarding right. um, the Orthodox. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, I guess I'm the only Sephardic in this room, so I'm just going to say, for the longest time, um, they didn't allow the party girl to join their community. So it's, it's kind of interesting that, you know, there's always this concept of, oh, we only hang out the only orthodox, but it's like, we're like Ashkenazi orthodox rather than, you know, like Mizrahis or Sephardic. Great, great, Della. Good, I made a note of that. I'm gonna come back to this great point also. I think Michael Kosoy was gonna share something. Thank you, Della. Um, I wish to go back to your point that Kabbalah can be a common ground for unification. Because uh, both in Gra, it was the greatest Kabbalist, right? And Baal Shem Tov took uh, Kabbalah so up to, to teach children all this movement, right? They opened basically this hidden wisdom to everybody. So my question is why it didn't become at least at that time, a common ground. Uh, from one side, there were two different traditions, like ecstatic Kabbalah by Abu Lafia, and more uh, rationalistic way of Zohar. Though Ari probably kind of combining both those approaches. Nevertheless, at that time, it was not the common ground. Uh, now, my question, you also mentioned this Chachma, uh, Bina, uh, Dat, right? Three, the Chabad. So uh, one of the question, can you see that Lubavitch movement is kind of more inclusive than uh, other Hasidic sects? Thank you. Great, great, um, amazing, thank you. By the way, is that over your, next to your right shoulder, is that the spherot on the wall? 
Yes. Okay, okay, great, great. Okay, all right, I, I, I made a note of your points here too as well. Is there any, Matthew did, Newman, did you wanna share anything before we go on? Okay, maybe not. Okay, so good, thank you. So to start with Della's point here, I think this is a very important point of when we talk about exclusion um, and we talk about some of that polarization that the Sephardic world, the levels of exclusion that have emerged in the Sephardic world, not to mention the discrimination in Israel that has happened for Sephardic Jews um, and, um, and in American Judaism, that the Sephardic Jews who are often off the radar, um, you know, whether it's Mizrahi or it's from Northern Africa or from Spain or, um, you know, uh, India, I mean, really all, really all over the world. And um, part of that is a question of Jews for, for, of Jews of color. Part of it is the, is the different cultures there. And Dell is absolutely right um, about that exclusion. And when we're talking about the Misnagdim and the um, and the Hasidic world, we really are talking about the Ashkenazi world. The, um, the Sephardic world was much more poetic than rationalist in terms of their thinkers, at least. Um, if you look at the poetry of Sephardic Judaism, if you look at the art of Sephardic Judaism, uh, the emotional realm, it was really, um, uh, it, and it's been unexplored or, uh, and unappreciated fully in terms of what Sephardic Judaism has to contribute uh, to the realm of, 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 of ideas. And it's still a source of exclusivity in American Judaism that, um, that Sephardic Jews are not as engaged for various reasons. Um, and I think part of that has to do with that Ashkenazi Judaism was very influenced by the church. And Sephardic Judaism was very influenced by the mosque. If you walk into an Ashkenazi synagogue, it sounds like a church, like we were talking about. Mostly it sounds quiet. Uh, it's orderly. It has certain types of music, like a church influence. If you walk into a Sephardic synagogue, it sounds more like a mosque. People are participating uh, responsibly from the crowd. Uh, it has a more nasal, kind of a, a more nasal um, approach to it. Uh, it it's, it's much less feminist. Ashkenazi Judaism is much more feminist than Sephardic Judaism, which is much more male driven. Um, very, very big differences. And I think American Judaism has much more been aligned with Christianity than it has with, with Islam. So it's a great point, Della. Uh, to go to Michael uh, um, Kronfeld's point there, um, a really great point about today and coming together today um, I think, and what we're trying to do here, yeah, I think part of what we're trying to do here is in the realm of pluralism in ideas to appreciate different sides of debates, to appreciate um, the diversity of thought and of partnership and, and promote tolerance and pluralism. And part of it is actually practically to do that as well, that we have very different orientations in the world and to come together to do that. And unfortunately, <clears throat> There's a lot of intolerance from a lot of different groups of various kinds. And the most obvious one pointed to here is in the realm where uh, the Orthodox will not participate. For example, in just looking at the Phoenix community, all we can, we can look, it, it applies all over the, all over the, all over the world. <laughs> um, there's, there's only, um, you know, outside of Beit Midrash, the Valley Beit Midrash, there's only one Orthodox ordained rabbi who's willing to sit on a panel with non-Orthodox um, leaders. The rest say, no, it would validate them. As a rule, I'm not allowed to sit on a panel with them. I mean, that's really uh, upsetting that we can't even have a, a public conversation lest it lead to validation of non-Orthodox uh, of Judaism. So this is a challenge now that our Orthodoxy has so much to offer, but this realm of exclusivity and of, of disdain and um, is really a, a really a sore spot and, um, and, and a, a real, a, a tragic side of what of what Orthodox Judaism looks like today. Um, the, and that's not what the Baal Shem Tov would have, would have been interested in, I believe. Now, Michael Kasoy's points here are really, really great. Um, partly, and then we'll wrap up here for the day. Um, Kabbalah is common ground, I think is a wonderful idea, um, really, because Kabbalah offers, as, as pointed out, um, the Kabbalah is embraced by the Gra and it's embraced by the Besht. And even though they're gonna use it in different ways, their fundamental appreciation for Jewish mysticism. Um, because when it comes to Jewish law, the reform and the Orthodox are gonna disagree. The liberal Orthodox and the Satmar are gonna disagree, right? The way we practice Judaism is gonna look very different. When it comes to pray, prayer, the way we're gonna pray is very different. But when it comes to Kabbalah, the mystical realm, 
there's enormous potential for common ground, I think is exactly right. And in terms of inclusivity, the Chabad model is interesting. There's only two groups of Hasidic Jews that are engaged in outreach. Um, every other Hasidic group opposes outreach efforts. And those two groups are Breslov and Lubavitch. Um, and they take very different approaches. And interesting enough, for both of them, the Rebbe's are dead. Every other Hasidic movement has a living Rebbe. Um, the Breslov movement still has Rebbe Nachman as the Rebbe, even though he's dead. And the Lubavitch movement hasn't appointment, appointed a new Rebbe ever since the, 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 the last Lubavitch Rebbe passed. And they are the only two outreach movements. They, they should not be misunderstood to be pluralistic. They don't believe in uh, multiple truths um, in different forms of Judaism. They believe in inclusivity, mean you are welcome to come drink our scotch and eat our children's. You are welcome to come pray here. It doesn't matter if you ate pig 10 minutes ago. It doesn't matter if you drove here or didn't drive here. You are still welcome to participate in our model of Judaism. But that notion of Chabad, they are the most intellect. You don't think of Chabad as intellectual, but their theology is the most intellectual of, of various Hasidic groups. And, and part of that has to do with the Chabad, the fact that it, it the Chachma, Bina, and Dat. They have, a, they, they have a, a, a level of sophistication in their theology that other Hasidic groups take a more simple, simple approach. So friends, I end here with a, a bracha. I hope we can continue to learn all of this, experience the debate, but not only experience it historically and sociologically today, but experience it in ourselves and challenge ourselves to go deeper into a more, more full Jewish spiritual and intellectual experience. Have a wonderful day and please stay tuned on the changes to our schedule. We're not meeting in the next two weeks, but then we're back to a regular schedule more or less. See you soon. Thank you so much.